All right, here's what I think. Open world games have been around for quite a while now. This genre has always pushed the limits of what's possible in video games, and that alone helped bring these sorts of games into the limelight. The thing is, I'm starting to get sick of open world games as a trend. So many AAA games these days have these expansive levels included, as an added bonus for players to explore. Hell, it's become more of an expectation rather than a bonus. The thing is, regardless of how beautiful or how large most open world games are, a large chunk of them lack something crucial. Substance. Video games are an interactive medium, and so if you prioritize the sheer size of a world over interactability, you end up making a bad game. There's no if, ands, or buts about it, that's just a fact. So when The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild came out, gamers everywhere were blown away, myself included. This game managed to have its cake and eat it too. The world was beautiful and massive, but felt just as dense and exciting as a game half its size. Hyrule felt truly and honestly real, filled with NPCs, monsters, treasure, and quests. There was always something new around every corner. People enjoyed the game because it let players go on their own adventure within the world, to carve their own path and to create their own stories. So taking into consideration the things that made Breath of the Wild such a successful open world game, I'd like to offer up another game that I think has earned a similar reputation. I think that Dark Souls is a good open world game. Now, I know what you're thinking. Can a linear game like Dark Souls really be open world? Some would argue that it can't, that because of the fixed path the game sets you on, it doesn't fit the genre. But would this argument not also disqualify Breath of the Wild? Despite the sheer size of its map, it ultimately has an intended route that players should take. Both games even have a similar structure. They both feature one powerful final boss that the protagonist must defeat to re-establish balance, as well as four major bosses at each corner of the map that players can tackle in any order they see fit. If you'd rather not progress the story right away, there's also plenty of optional areas and side quests for you to do to pass the time. No matter what you do though, you will ultimately face off against the big bad. The only difference is, Dark Souls actually lets you choose how you end the game. In Breath of the Wild, you just do it. You have no say in how the story wraps up. Even despite all of its freedoms, Breath of the Wild narrows at a point where Dark Souls opens up. So with this in mind, I've got three points I want to run through detailing why I think the Souls series can be labeled as open world games. Then, after that, I'll be bringing it back home to discuss why I think they're good open world games to boot. So, without further ado, let's hop right in. Saying that Dark Souls has some good level design would be the understatement of the century. The Souls series has always excelled in the realm of level design, with a number of worlds that are not only enjoyable to explore, but all have a crucial component that sets them apart from other traditional adventure games. Connectivity. Think about a game like Super Mario 64, with one fairly large hub world connecting to other smaller worlds via paintings. Now replace Peach's Castle with Firelink Shrine, take the paintings out, and maybe add a few paths connecting the various worlds within, and you've got yourself Dark Souls. The world isn't this disconnected mess of loading screens and level selects, it's been purposefully designed to feel connected, with locales that blend into each other more naturally than other games. On top of that, most Souls games intentionally create these beautiful, scenic views that actually contain areas you'll be visiting later in the game. Think Bloodborne. When you first leave Yusefka's clinic, one of the first things you see is the massive Cathedral Ward, which towers above Yarnum, begging players to rise to the streets above and conquer it. So if you see an area in the distance, 9 times out of 10, you'll probably end up going there. The way the entirety of a Souls game's map weaves and intertwines with itself is quite a clever feat of design, but these same sort of design practices can be seen on the smaller scale as well. Most Souls games, specifically ones spearheaded by Hidetaka Miyazaki, have these obsessively interconnected worlds, with an almost obscene amount of shortcuts. Like seriously, the shortcut porn in these games is outrageous, and I love it. Not only does it feel fantastic to unlock a gate or find an elevator that brings you back to a previous bonfire, but you're also creating a mental map of the area as you do that, helping you realize just how attached everything is within one specific locale. Despite how massive and overwhelming some areas might seem, they're 
always just densely packed locales, and as soon as you start opening up those shortcuts, you begin to realize just how open each world really is. We've all come to a fork in the road at one point or another. One path takes you to your destination, while the other leads somewhere completely new. Whether in the real world or in a video game, there are two approaches to such a fork. You could follow the first path, heading towards your goal as quick as possible, or you could take a risk and follow the scenic route. If you take the road less traveled, you'll actively be expanding your view, allowing yourself to explore someplace entirely new. It's a lot less common to use this approach IRL, but in the virtual world, adventure is the name of the game. So when you reach a fork in the road in Dark Souls, you immediately realize how much bigger your world has become. An open world has got to be big, right? Well, if that's what you're looking for, the Souls series has got it. The games continually offer players these choices. Which door should you open? Which path should you walk? And neither is necessarily right or wrong. They're just choices. So you can explore each expansive world to your heart's content, and while doing so, you can create your own, unique adventure in the process. Let's use Bloodborne as an example here. When you beat Father Gascoigne and enter the Cathedral Ward, you're given two options. The first is to descend into Old Yarnum and face off against the Blood-Starved Beast, and unlock the rest of the Cathedral Ward in the process. Alternatively, Players who have stocked up on plenty of Blood Echoes can simply purchase the key to the locked gate and explore the rest of the Cathedral Ward right away, facing off against tougher enemies and coming face to face with Vicar Amelia far earlier. It's a riskier move, but it's still an option presented to players. Then, after you beat Vicar Amelia, the world opens up even more. Players could head down into the Forbidden Woods towards Bergenworth, or they could head to Hemwick Charnel Lane and face off against the Witch of Hemwick. Or, if they get caught by a Snatcher, they could be taken to the Hypogean Gao, giving them a sneak peek at an endgame area. Hell, if players went the bold route and just bought the key to the Cathedral Ward Gate, then they could just go down into Old Yarnum and fight Blood Starved Beast now. It's almost overwhelming how large the world has become after a single boss fight, and it's all yours to explore at your own discretion. Another point worth considering is the matter of warping. A lot of open world games contain some sort of warp mechanic, generally allowing players the ability to teleport to one of many predetermined warp spots. The Souls series has always had some method of traveling around the map, but I'm not trying to say that any game with teleportation counts as open world. It's how the Souls series uses these teleports that makes them a strong contender for such a title. Traditionally speaking, warps like these are included because players don't want to travel halfway across the map to get to a single item or talk to a single NPC. So they warp, and in doing so, they save themselves a lot of time and hassle. The Soul series is no different. With areas so massive and tricky to explore, you kind of need some form of warp by default. But not every Souls game gives you that off the bat. The first Dark Souls' approach to this is actually fairly clever. For most of the game, you don't have the luxury of warping. If you want to go somewhere, you've got to walk. And so more often than not, players will keep moving until they hit a wall. But after ringing both Bells of Awakening and rising to the top of Sen's Fortress, you very literally hit a wall. The wall to Anor Londo. You're now trapped in what appears to be an endgame area, and there's no way for you to get back to Firelink, not without sacrificing your progress. But then, after beating Ornstein and Smog, you come face to face with Guinevere. She provides you with a very important tool for the rest of your journey, the Lord Vessel. And the moment that you receive that item, the world of Dark Souls grows a little bigger. With the Lord Vessel, you can teleport to bonfires almost everywhere in the game, which not only allows you to escape the confines of Anorlando, but it lets you re-explore the rest of the world. Areas previously thought to be dead ends open up into entirely new areas, filled with new enemies and bosses for you to face off against. With that, you can finally see Lord Ren in its entirety. It's massive, almost overwhelming entirety. It's a big game, folks. Real big. All of this comes back to Breath of the Wild. That sweet little open world nugget that everyone wanted a piece of. Everyone sang its praises for having such a dense, exciting world despite its size and it deserved every bit of that praise. 
it was the kind of world players could find themselves getting lost in. Whether it be tackling the four divine beasts, or simply just climbing a mountain for a beautiful view. Players could create their own adventures, choose their own paths, and make their own stories. It was the perfect adventure game, the perfect way to shake up a franchise that had been stuck in its ways for decades. The Soul series, however, has all those same freedoms. Okay, m maybe you can't climb anything you see, but players still have the choice to explore the world as they see fit. And there's a lot to tackle there. Every Souls game has these incredibly dense areas filled with valuable items and equally as many powerful enemies. Players need to be cautious as they explore. They need to adapt to the cruel and unforgiving nature of the series, remaining vigilant at all times. With new traps and monsters around every corner, the world players are interacting with feels anything but empty. But the game isn't all monsters and death. Every path is littered with NPCs, colorful characters that you can interact with and encounter at multiple different junctions. As the game progresses, you can watch their own personal adventures shape out, and how they grow alongside you. Not only do the quests and covenants they provide you with enrich your experience within the world, but they remind you of just how real and alive the game is. The people you meet, the items you discover, the weapons and armor you choose to equip, it's all yours to decide, because it's your adventure. The Soul series tends to be the butt of a lot of jokes these days, specifically in its being compared to almost every game in existence. Yes, Dark Souls is a challenging game, but it's so much more than hard bosses and powerful enemies. It's a cleverly designed adventure game with some of the most memorable areas and encounters, and it's easily one of my favorite franchises of all time. Whether you're playing these games to create the most powerful, hyper-optimized character, or simply to lose yourself in a faraway land, you're experiencing Dark Souls. And that's all that matters. It's your game, your world, your adventure. You can do with it what you wish. That is what an open world game should be. Hi there! Thank you so much for watching this video. Uh, if you enjoyed it, leave a like and uh, comment down below. Let me know what you thought of the video. If you want to see more analysis videos like this, uh, just subscribe to our channel. And if you want to stay up to date on all the goings on of the Digital Dream Club, you can follow us on Twitter at DigiDreamClub. I hope you have an awesome day. See ya!